The Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, episode 670? For Sunday, August 13th, 2017. <laughs> And welcome to the Mac Observer's Mac Geek Gab, the show where you send in tips, questions, cool stuff found. We share your tips. We answer your questions. We share cool stuff found. The goal, of course, being all of us to learn at least four new things each and every time we get together. Sponsors for this episode include BB Edit from Barebones Software at barebones.com. We'll talk more about that later. And Eero. Uh, the new mesh wireless sensation at Eero, E-E-R-O dot com, where coupon code MGG gets you free overnight shipping if you put it together just so. We'll talk more about that a little bit later here in Durham, New Hampshire. I'm Dave Hamilton. Here in Fairfield, Connecticut, John F. Braun. How goes it, Mr. F. Braun? Yeah. yeah. Comes and it goes, huh? It goes. It's coming. It's going. Yeah. Chronic. <laughs> You know, that's how it goes. Hey, a uh, bunch of cool stuff found. We'll start right off the top with Dave. Dave, not me, but listener Dave. Dave says, the Soft Arena folks recently released a new version of their YouTube downloader, which they call SYC2 or Soft Arena YouTube Converter 2. Essentially, this downloads any YouTube video in any of the standard resolutions and stores it on your Mac or wirelessly stores it on your iPhone or iPad or stuffs it into iTunes. Uh, he talks about how it works quite well. And he says, uh, I also use soft Arena's Walter two tool W a L T R two to move audio files onto my iPhone without going through iTunes. Another incredibly well-built product that does one thing very well. You are totally right about the soft Arena folks. And especially with Walter, man, it it's, it works really well and it's magic because a lot of those movies that Walter can just magically put directly onto your iPhone or iPad, iTunes would actually want to convert to uh, in what they call an iOS capable format, even though there are many more uh, iOS capable formats, but iTunes would, would either not send it or ask you to convert it first. So very, very good stuff. Thank you for sharing that, Dave. Fun. And uh, we actually have two for the same cool stuff found. Uh, both listener Todd and Stefan have uh, have recommendations for Beatunes, B-E-A-T-U-N-E-S. We'll start with Todd and perhaps finish up with, with Stefan. He says, um, seems like uh, Beatunes would assist the many listeners who have reached out over the years to looking to fix or straighten out their iTunes libraries. And and Stefan sort of adds a little more color to that. He says in show 658, in response to a listener complaining about Apple Music screwing up his album art in iTunes, you talked about TuneUp or its latest incarnation, TuneUp Relaunch, as a way to fix metadata. Dave said that he was not able to find any other software on the market to do this. Allow me to help. After the original TuneUp's future became questionable. I searched for an alternative and found one with B-Tunes, B-E-A-T-U-N-E-S, uh, from Tagtrom Industries. The program will not only analyze your iTunes music for various issues, but also build playlists based on criteria like mood, BPM, and other things. It is multi-language and cross-platform. It's a Java application, but it looks totally native on Mac OS and is frequently updated. It even has an API that allows you to build your own plugins for it. So there you go. And then we get a bonus. Cool stuff found from Stefan. In show 667, a listener looked for a way to tag photos on the iPhone. This prompted me to look for an app as I also wanted this feature. My search tuned up Metagear by Ilya Kustinov. Oh, sorry, I got that wrong. Uh, Kuznetsov. Uh, this app integrates with photos where it can... Oh, what did I do to myself? Where it can be called from the editing tools icon of a photo. There you can view, edit, or delete various EXIF and IPTC categories. Tags can be found under keywords. So that's pretty cool. I like both of those. That's good stuff. And Beatunes. Pretty good. Hey, um, I, I want to talk while we're right here about this, though, John, because um, Stefan mentioned that Beatunes is a Java app. 
And, uh, and Java, we've talked about this on the show a couple of times, but it's worth, it bears repeating a Java app is Java has gotten a bad rap um, for all of the security holes that can exist when you're running Java inside a web browser from a website uh, because that website could execute nefarious code and all of that stuff. Running a Java application like Btunes on your Mac is very different from running a Java app in your web browser from, you know, an unknown source. So I, I, I don't have any problem running a Java app. Crash plan is a Java app and, and, and sort of got lumped in with, with that whole, you know, Java bad um, uh, rhetoric that was going on. And it's just not, it's, it's, you run, you install the Java engine. It does not make your web browser less secure. It's all good. You have any thoughts to, to add some color to that, John? No, I'm fine with Java. You're fine with Java. Yeah. I mean, there's one app that I run, um, which I wouldn't need to anymore if I had waited, but the, uh, the utility that configures my uh, TP-Link switch oh, okay. is actually yeah. a Java app. Yeah. Cool. Um, you also have to do something kind of crazy to get it to run. You have to do some sort of firewall reconfiguration because the way it runs under Windows, which is the expected environment, it's actually a Java app inside of like a Windows EXE. It's really weird. Now now it's um, that same switch. You It has a web interface as any switch oh, should. As, yeah, well, Running an app is just silliness. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Well, for that kind of thing, for something that's a network device that you need to connect to over, over the network. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Yeah. Cool. Uh, all right. And then moving onward, trip it. One of my favorite things. If you travel, uh, you know, I, I, I talk about traveling a lot on the show, but I don't travel a ton. I mean, maybe I'm on airplanes these days. It's even less than it used to be, but you know, it's probably three to five times a year. But um, even with that, TripIt and their TripIt Pro service are totally worth it because it, they to, they know all of the they they are hyper focused on delivering all of the things that travelers need, like flight uh, updates. They they keep track of you know delays and alert you to check ins and all of that stuff. And then they also try to make kind of your in travel experience better. And this week they just added interactive airport maps. So. Uh, if you're in an airport and you need to find something there, TripIt has tons of airports now in the app and will provide you walking steps, step by step walking directions uh, to get you to where you need to go in the airport, which can be super handy and save you a ton of time. Uh, just like GPS with your car. You know, if you're not guessing which is the best path to, to use to get somewhere, that's always a good thing. So I was pretty stoked to see TripIt add that. You use TripIt when you travel, right, John? Nope. Really? Oh, oh, nah, never jumped on that bandwagon. Okay. It's a good bandwagon to be on I, again. I mean, I know you, you know, you, you travel a little bit less than me, but still when you're doing it, it's just the, the best part about it is, I don't know if there's a best part The sort of the core functionality is you just dump all of your travel reservations into trip it and it organizes them into trips and keeps everything good. And the way you dump them in is you just forward when you get your hotel confirmation or your airline confirmation or whatever, you just forward it to plans at tripit.com and it aggregates it all and puts it all together and builds a nice little itinerary and schedule that you don't have to think about. So it's pretty awesome. Yeah. Good. All right. I will say I'm all electronic in my recent travels. <clears throat> well, so of course it's now they nice don't to have you on that bandwagon too. Yeah. Well, like, you know, we did our last uh, train trip. They have a, uh, yeah. uh, iPhone app where you show them your screen and they somehow know if you paid for a ticket or not, which I think is cool. They don't, all know, my flights, they don't know if you paid. <laughs> Actually, no, they, they kind of do. do. Yeah, they kind of do. No, it's they true. do. It shows three color bars that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're not, they're not scanning the barcode, bar but you're right. The, the app still makes it pretty clear that you paid. Yeah. Yeah. And no. uh, all my flights as of late, I've, you know, used the, uh, yeah, like the, you know, the, the one to Mac stock, it was actually kind of cool. So, you know, I, I didn't even check my bag because I had a small bag because it was sure. a, a short trip. But yeah. uh, 
just, you know, waltzed right up there, got my, uh, you know, they scanned my boarding pass, uh, did electronic check-in, um, <laughs> made them uh, do the touchy-feely because I didn't want to go through the radiation. <laughs> I don't like that electronic part at all. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes it's good. All right, uh, Joe, let's, uh, Joe, bring, bringing us back to Cool Stuff Found. Joe says, hey, guys, I smiled when you mentioned the Logitech MX Master that works across multiple PCs. That was the uh, the mouse that magically allows you to see to move and uh, control two different computers with just uh, with one mouse. You've obviously not seen the link. Logitech is great, but buying their expensive mouse for this feature, I say, bah, no, thanks. Let's go all the way with the full KVM feature set over IP plus drag and drop copy paste and across Mac windows and Linux. It's from Simlist.com and it's called synergy and oh yeah, it's only 19 bucks, 29. If you want to do it with SSL, I, he says I paid more for a two way wired KVM than I would wrestle around with stiff cables constantly. I think I'm in love. So KVM is keyboard video mouse uh, tying it all together and yeah this is just software to do it seems pretty pretty cool so we will put that in the show notes too i like it i like it it's pretty good ah uh, thoughts about that john no no okay awesome Get some caffeine. In the meantime, I have a, a tip to share. We recently started talking about iOS 11 and uh, the betas and all that on this show. And I ran into a problem with two, uh, both, in fact, I should say, of my iOS 11 devices. And that is I routinely use Spotlight on iOS to launch apps. Uh, I do it by, you know, I pull down from the top of the screen, start typing the name of an app and it, you know, it finds it and then I launch it. Great. So if I want to launch, say, Dropbox, I start typing D-R-O. I'll get a few apps with, you know, that, that contain that phrase D-R-O. And then, boom, I'm good to go. And I've done this with iOS 10 by going into settings. And I've really or I've tweaked this by going to iOS 10 settings. Uh, you go to general and spotlight search. And then in that, um, it gets a little interesting, right? Because... I don't like to necessarily see results from the contents of Dropbox in my search. I just want to launch Dropbox. So I've gone in to settings general on iOS 10. This is in prior into spotlight search and turned off the search results um, uh, switches for most of my apps. Like I, especially things like contacts. I, I just I don't search for contacts that way and I don't want them to show up that way, but I do want to be able to launch the contacts app that way. And that has worked very, very well. Well, with iOS 11, that setting has changed, but it is inherited. So if I had turned off, say, Dropbox and contacts in that place in iOS 10 and then I go into settings on iOS 11, um, if I go into settings and Siri and search, so it's not inside general anymore. Now I have a list of apps at the bottom and they, uh, there is generally at least one option in them, sometimes more. And that option is search and Siri suggestions. And if I had turned it off on iOS 10, iOS 11 inherits that on the search and, uh, the Siri and search suggestions. The problem is by turning that off on iOS 11, the app doesn't appear in my drop down list uh, or in my search results unless I type the entire name of the app. So in the case of Dropbox on iOS 10, even with this option turned off, I could type DRO and Dropbox would appear on iOS 11. I, I can type DROPBO and it does not appear. And then I type X and boom. It appears. So I will have to go through painstakingly and re-enable search and Siri suggestions on all of my uh, iOS 11 devices. So I recommend doing it on your iOS 10 device before you do the upgrade. 
because it's way faster to do it there than it is to do it on on iOS 11. But if you search for apps to launch them, that's the only way to do it. Pretty interesting, huh, John? Yeah, and I, I I will report this to Apple because it feels like if it's gonna if it's gonna surface the application name when I type the full name, well then it should surface it when I type partial names too. So maybe this is a bug. I will report it to Apple. But for those of you, certainly those of you using the beta, this is it's good to know. Thoughts, John? <clears throat> I'm not running the beta. Aha. I only have one. Well, I only have one device. Oh, that's right. Yeah, I, I am running the beta on my on my main device now. Um, I started with with developer beta five or uh, developer preview five, I guess it's called. So, which is I I believe very very similar, if not the same as public beta four. So, and that setting in iOS ten to answer the question from Karan in our chat room at macgeekgub.com slash stream is in. Settings, general spotlight search. So it has moved. So, yes. Anyway, very, very interesting. All right, John. Shall we, uh, shall we talk a little bit about backups? Now that, we, we, now that we've gotten iOS 11 out of the way, we have a question from Tyler, which is sort of related to, uh, I think it's actually very much related to the High Sierra, the changes coming with High Sierra. Tyler asks in the last episode, it was mentioned that there uh, are the, the new APFS file system uh, would only function on SSDs. Will this also be true for cloned drives and backup drives? I currently run time machine to an Apple airport and also time machine to an external with clones going to a NAS. All right. So I, I, I want to, I want to kind of go in reverse order of this. I want to address the second part of his question first, and then I want to talk about APFS on non SSDs. Cause I think you've got some experience with that, John, but in terms of this clones, the way we generally discuss them here are file copies, right? Where you say, okay, I want to make that drive there look exactly like this drive here. So go and clone or copy all the files. And that's what carbon copy cloner does. That's what super duper does. And with that type of file copy, it doesn't matter if the two mediums, the two discs are of the same format, right? It, it, it just doesn't matter because all we're doing is copying files. Now, both of them need to support the same type of file naming structures and any limitations on one, you know, would, would potentially cause a, a conflict. But in a general sense, it doesn't matter. Um, certainly the format of the disk doesn't matter. Just like you can copy files from your Mac to a Windows formatted thumb drive. Same kind of thing here. So carbon copy cloner cloning your APFS formatted internal SSD to an externally formatted um, HFS plus drive. No problem. It does get a little weird when you start doing recovery partitions and all of that stuff. And actually the folks uh, over at Bombic software have a blog post sort of talking about those nuances and they're working on high Sierra support. They may have a beta out with it. I, I'm not exactly sure yet, but, but even, even without that, just doing your normal daily clones, not going to be a problem. Um, and, and, you know, when you're, and when you're, and then time machine, um, time machine will be completely rewritten for APFS uh, because of all the sort of differences there. But even then it's the time machine essentially does file copies. Um, and then it does some hard linking and things like that on the destination. But, uh, but it does file copies and not on NAS drive. If you're backing up, either cloning or copying your NAS drive light, very likely isn't APFS or HFS plus it's whatever format the NAS is, which is often EXT three or EXT four, or sometimes BTRFS. Uh, so, you know, it, it formats don't matter. And generally on a NAS, when you're doing a clone, uh, depending on how you're doing it, you might be doing it to a disc image. You might just be doing it as raw files and you can do it either way with things like current copy cloner. So, uh, if, before we move on to the other thing, John, thoughts about that part of it that you have to share? Uh, I'm with you. They're working on it. I, I was perusing 
what a carbon copy cloner has to say. And there are some issues, and they're yeah. working on it. Right, right. But the general it's not, copies it's not are okay, totally, right? Yeah, yeah. The, the 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 issues come up, and they're addressing them. And I guess they found some, you know, uh, problems. But you know, making something usable and bootable, making it a true clone, right, can be a challenge, especially if you're going, if if you're going from one file system to another. That but makes sense. Yep. Yep. All right. So now back to the first part of his question. And, and we talked a little bit about this last week and said we would follow up. Running APFS on non SSDs, it's not going to do it by default, but you can make it do it. Right. Kind of. <laughs> Well, you know, I tried this because I, you know, I have the beta on an external uh, non-SSD rotational drive. Okay. And I was actually able, using disutility, to uh, format it as uh, APFS. Sure. And then I tried to uh, uh, install the uh, beta 5, developer mm -hmm. beta 5, and it's like, nope, nope, nope. Oh, because be you can't dude. boot from a rotational drive running APFS, right? Well, the the... The OS just refused to install. It's like, I, I am not going to install on this rotational drive with APFS. You have to make it HFS plus. Isn't that interesting? That it makes existed. sense. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The thing is, technically, I don't see why they would inform. I guess the, the bad things happen. Uh, <laughs> APFS is probably not optimized for rotational drives. So that's why they say, no, stop it. Don't do this. Well, you know, uh, Jeff Butts and I did a bunch of testing. We talked about it on the show, but back in a March and April, we did a bunch of testing, performance testing of APFS, and it's not even optimized for SSDs yet. And, and I talked with some little birdies at Apple who mm -hmm. confirmed that, that, yeah, 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 we have it stable, not fast. So, I mean, that's good, you know, stable, but not fast. Mm -hmm. So, um, it, and where it's not fast is in raw transfer speed. So if you have like big, like again, you know, video files or, or that kind of, kind of thing where you're just moving gobs of data back and forth, APFS is going to fall. I think it's about 30% short of, 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 a, of HFS plus. And by the way, that's true on both Mac OS and on iOS. So there you go. Because we're all, well, anybody that's running, what, 10.3.1 and later, uh, including iOS 11, is running APFS on your iPhone and iPad and all that stuff. So, but yes, to, to, to comment or to share Brian Monroe's comment and support that. Uh, he says stable is good. And I totally agree. <laughs> yeah. And for most of the things that most of us do, we're not like the raw speed of the drive is it's really not important. Um, it, it's, you know, kind of the, the speed of things like finder duplications and all of that where the efficiencies of APFS really, really shine. And, and so stable is good. I agree. Any more thoughts on that, Mr. Braun? Moving on. Moving on. All right, Steve, you want to take you want to take uh, take a run at Steve here, John. Actually, <laughs> you, you know I'm what not. I want to do before we go to Steve, because uh, I have a feeling we will go for a while on this. I want to talk about our two sponsors. So our first sponsor today is BB Edit from Bare Bones Software. BB Edit, you know, it's just one of my favorite apps. Uh, it, and I, it sounds crazy. I say this often that I love a text editor as much as I do. But man, like there's so much that we do on our computers that use text or that you that uses text. And BB Edit is so good at manipulating and just showing you text files without any crazy formatting or anything like that. It's just text. And so it's really great to be able to take some text from one place. Like I, wh what I use it for, it, it, there are things that I use it for that I'm very intentional about. And it like the BB edit feature set is awesome for, and that's like comparing two files, which I do all the time, highlights the differences or 
counting the just simply counting the words and characters in a file. You know, a lot of times when you're filling out like a web form or something, it says, uh, you know, limit your response to 200 characters, and but they won't give you a counter. It's like crap. And so, you know, I bring it over and I do it and BB edit and I can see the little counter running and I edit and I, you know, parse and sh- 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 there you go. It's OK. And then I copy and paste it back into the web form. But uh, but, you know, one of the things that I use constantly is when I'm copying text and it comes with all this formatting or whatever, I just do a round trip through BB edit. I paste it into BB edit, which only is a text editor. So it just can't even fathom any, any of that other formatting. Then I copy it out of BB edit and I paste it in elsewhere. Really, really handy stuff. You got to check it out. Go to uh, barebones.com. Check out BB edit. You can download a free trial. Beautiful, beautiful stuff. Thanks so much to Barebones for sponsoring this episode. Our second sponsor is Eero, E-E-R-O dot com, who just came out with their second generation mesh product. You folks know that I am obsessed with routers. I've built quasi meshes in my home for the last 10 years. Um, Eero could not have come soon enough. They really pioneered this in-home mesh concept. And now, because they were here first... They've now got their second generation of hardware out. So the second generation of hardware has a a, a lot of cool things. First of all, it adds a completely different form factor of device called the beacon, which just plugs into an electrical outlet and still participates in extends uh, is a fully blown mesh point. And in fact, is even 30 percent faster than the original Eros when it's when it's used that way. And then there's the second gen Eero, uh, you know, Ethernet capable base station that could work as uh, as your router or work as a mesh point if you want to do it that way. And this adds a third radio so that you get two five gigahertz radios in in these second gen Eros plus the one two point four gigahertz radio. That means and it can be dynamically recon- reconfigured. And of course, Eero takes care of all that. You don't have to think about it. But it can use that extra radio for the back hall between the devices or for the front hall to your, you know, iPhones and MacBooks and things like that. Very, very cool. Very, very well done. And the second gen Eero adds QoS for your WAN port for that buffer bloat protection. And they are using the best in class algorithm, FQ Codel. I've tried this here. I've got an Eero 2 set up with the beacons going in the office. It is stellar how well it works. And it's just so easy. You just plug this stuff in, it figures it out, and it goes. Really, really well done. Uh, I just put together a piece teaching everyone uh, how to choose the right mesh for you. And it will come as no great surprise. And it has nothing to do with the fact that they're a sponsor. Eero came to the top of that list for me. Again, you can read the article and decide for yourself. Really, really cool stuff. You got to check it out. So here's the deal. They've got a deal for you because you're a Mac Geek Cab listener. So visit Eero.com, E-E-R-O.com. Choose which package you want. You can get one with, you know, two beacons and a base station. or You can get one with three base stations or you can buy base stations separately. Do, you know, mix and match to whichever one you want. Add it to your cart. Add overnight shipping. They're going to put a charge in for overnight shipping. Don't hit buy yet. Put in the coupon code MGG. And once you apply that, that will then make the overnight shipping free. So visit Eero.com, E-E-R-O.com, free shipping, add coupon code MGG to get that overnight shipping. You'll have Eero next business day. I was going to say you'll have it tomorrow. You know, somebody will yell at me if I say that. So next business day, that's just how it's going to go because that's how shipping works. Our sincere thanks to Eero for both doing what they do and for sponsoring this episode. All right, John, take it away, man. All right, Steve has something to say, and we got something to say about what Steve has to say. Yeah. But it's a good topic to revisit. It is. So, Steve says, I know you know, but not everyone seems to remember. Always hold down shift and or option when selecting menus. There's many good things hidden in there. He's right about that, for sure. Now, all right, here's where, well... (laughs) 
Which menu is Steve now, talking about in particular? Ah, John? he is talking about the time machine menu. Aha. Which uh, you should have. Um, I think almost everyone has, but it's a, it's a little clock with a arrow going in the wrong direction. Um, Cause it's going back in time. Isn't that cool? And if you click on that, normally you will see a few options back up now, enter time machine and open time machine preferences. Um, what he uh, and then he he goes on and this is this is where it gets uh, it gets kind of squirrely squirrel. Well, no, um, it, it, it read what he said because it. There well, here's was, what he says. Yeah. Yes. So yeah, there's some contrary, nuances to this. Yeah. Contrary to your assertion, the time machine isn't a real backup since it doesn't verify. Well, it can if you want it to. Okay, sure. It only works on a network backup like a time machine or a Synology. So completely so completely worthwhile for many of us. There's also a lot more magic in the TM utility available in the shell for the hardcore user. Take a look at TM util dash compare. Let, hang on. Let me, let me, let me fill in the missing gap here. So Steve is, is alerting us to the fact that if you go to the time machine menu and hold down the option key, you will see the backup now option change to verify backups, but only if it's a network backup. And that's what that's what Steve has said. And it also say browse other backup disks, which is kind of interesting. Yeah, and that's true. Yes, that's right. Yeah. And then if you hold down shift, it gets even more interesting. And I had I, I've seen the verify backups menu, but I, I honestly was not aware of what happens when you hold down shift. And if you hold down shift, you will actually see back up with consistency scan uh -huh. and enter time machine. And then I think this is where it gets complicated. So yeah. one, I'm going to shake my fist. So the thing is, uh, the, Steve interpreted this to mean that it does verification and he's he, not wrong. It, it depends on how you want to define verification. Right. So now first I want to shake my fist at them because they're using two different terms here. So if you hold down one, it says verify backups. And then the other one says consistency scan. In Apple's world, as far as I can tell, those are the same thing, but they're not doing to me. Verify means that you're going to, that you take the source and the destination and you compare them and make sure that they're, they're in sync with each other. To that, me, that is what a true verification of a backup is. That's right. And time machine never does that. How? No, no it does. It never compares. Well, not out of the, the box. No, no. Right. Hear me out on this. Okay. It never compares the source to the destination. Uh, wh what what is possible from the command line, maybe, is to compare the backup to the checksum that was made at the time the backup was done. It's still not comparing the source. It never, the, the, near as I can tell, there's nothing in Time Machine that will do that. But since I believe El Capitan, but certainly Sierra, Time Machine does store a checksum. So it could be argued that that's enough of the source data, but it stores it in the backup. And then it, it you can ask it to compare those things, but it never goes back and compares to the source. However, well, I, th I think the checksum, it actually, I think it's recomputing it. And I think it's comparing to what was computed. What no, was I, computed at the time of the backup. Correct. But that's not comparing back to the source. That's comparing to what it did back when it backed up. Two different things. I know it's nuanced, but it, it is important to, to highlight that. But here's the bigger thing before we get lost in those weeds. This verify backups option or backup with consistency scan is only available on network on network drives. Um, now, there's a significant difference between what happens when you back up locally to a direct attached disk and when you back up to a network drive. And the difference is locally, it's just doing a file copy. That's it. I mean, it's and it's doing some hard linking on the on the destination so that it can get things all right. But it it it's just a file copy. There's no interim step when you back up across a network. There is an interim step, and that interim step is it creates an HFS plus disk image on the destination and then opens that up and stuffs the backups inside it. And that's because Time Machine, at least with Sierra, 
is built to only work with HFS plus. And since you're, as we just discussed, your desk, your NAS drive, it doesn't, isn't HFS plus this gets it to the point where it is because it can do it all inside this container of a disk image. And you can only do the verification on the network backups. And what that verification is, is a file system check of the contents or not the contents, but of the structure of that, of that disc. Now here's where this gets a little sideways, John, because you mentioned that, um, that Steve discussed the TM util compare option. And that's an interesting one because that goes a lot further than the verification. As you said, it compares checksums, but it can also compare other metadata like, like file size, modification time and things like that. But that too only works on networked backups near as I can tell. I, I want to come back to this topic. Um, we can keep talking about it a little bit here, but I, I, we, we will circle back to this after we, John and or I have tested this with a local time machine backup. Neither one of us keeps local time machine backups. So we don't have one to test, but I will make one and, and test this because I want to see if Apple has added any of this TM util compare functionality to the uh, to the verify backups option because it's possible they have it's just it's not straightforward to find out because i want to see if tm util compare will run on a local drive you know what i mean i don't think mm -hmm. it does i i um but that's the that's the question it's it really really i wish apple was much clearer about this but they're not. Their their knowledge base articles are very very nebulous about it. Yeah, I guess the place to look. So I think the takeaway from this is that what you get from the time machine menu is pretty much just verifying the structure is valid. I, I it's believe not corrupt. that. Right. Right. <clears throat> and then if you go to the command line and you run tm util with certain options, you can get a better feel that the contents are somewhat consistent <laughs> or consistent with something you can do additional there but but it's not going to happen from the menu so i guess that's that's what you can take from this well but but see that's the thing we know in the past that was true that the the verify in the menu was only doing this this structure verification but the weird part is this tm util compare from the terminal also only works on network drives so why is that? Is it because it's not storing any of this checksum information when it does a local backup? And so it's not there. And and then sort of the follow-up question is, well, if TM Util Compare only works on network drives, it's certainly possible that Apple has added some of this TM Util Compare functionality to that verify backups thing and it just isn't clear about it. So it's possible that verify backups does more. We're just not sure. And of course they hide it. You need to use a, uh, you won't see time machine backups in the console anymore in Sierra. Uh, you have to use something like consolation or whatever to, uh, to filter them out and find them. So it's crazy. We'll also ask our, uh, Apple, to see if they want to comment on this too, because uh, it, it would be good to get that clarity. So I don't know. It's crazy, man. Crazy, crazy. Thanks, Steve, for um, for digging back into this with us. It's good to... It's good. Anyway. Thoughts, John? Any, any, any other thoughts on this one? My thought is always make more than one backup. <laughs> well, yeah. Don't just do a time machine backup. Yeah, right. <laughs> Don't just do a single time machine backup. Right, right, right. An alternating one is better. Yep using a different program is even better or -er, mm -hmm. like carbon copy cloner. Right. 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 Yeah. And the nice thing about both of those time machine and carbon copy cloner is that the results of those backups are readable by any Mac. You, you don't need special software to, to, to read them, which is, which is good. So, okay. Um, all right, let's see. Let's let's move on. Let's see how we do. I'm curious if we'll have time to get to 
some NAS stuff. We might. Jeremy asks, Jeremy asks, uh, I'm hoping you can help out. I have two Office 365 accounts, one each for two separate businesses with which I'm involved. Let's be outrageously imaginative and imaginative and call them company A and company B. In my email clients, I mainly use Apple Mail, but on occasion also Outlook and or AirMail. I have a number of project folders which are under company A in the side panel. I need to move some of those folders currently in A to B. The move command when selecting the folder and right clicking icons does not list company B as a destination, although it does list existing folders already created in company B. My questions, therefore, number one, how can I move folders and all the emails they're in from company A to company B? I have tried dragging from one account to the other, and this appears to create a duplicate, although it happened far too quickly for me to believe all the emails have actually been duplicated. Some of them have thousands of emails. Also, in one folder I dragged, some old emails appeared with today's date, but only some. If I do this, will they no longer exist in my company A account? So if I were to cancel my company A account, would the moved emails still exist in company B? And where do the emails actually live? Are they just on the servers or are they stored locally on my Mac? Again, I will go backwards. Uh, when mail is involved and you have it set up by default, uh, your emails will live in both places. And this is true with, with Office 365 accounts and, and IMAP accounts and things like that. That It is a client-server relationship and the Mac keeps a local cache, if you will. Uh, but it's a local copy of all of those messages. But if you go into the server and delete one and then let your Mac sync with the server, it will delete it from your Mac too. So just bear that in mind. But yes, the, the, the Mac by default will store copies of, of the messages locally. You can change that if you want. And that's not a bad thing to change, uh, especially if you are someone who travels a lot and you know you don't want to be downloading every single message from all of your archives into uh, into your laptop or something. You can go into mail preferences accounts, go into uh, mailbox behavior. Where is that? You know, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Download attachments and account information is where you can say, look, don't download any here and that sort of thing. You used to be able to control a lot more of this, but Apple takes it away. So that's question number one um, or that's actually question number three. But in, in talking about how to move these messages, uh, the way that I would do it is um, to move the email messages at the message level, not the folder level. So with, by that, I mean, if you have a folder called, you know, business meetings uh, on company A and you want to move that to company B, go to company B, create a folder called business meetings and then drag or you know copy and paste but copy and paste gets a little weird but dragging all of the messages so go into the company a business meetings folder select all drag those to the business meetings folder of company b it may appear that this happens right away um but because it could happen right away locally on your mac but it won't happen right away on the server Again, like I said, mail creates this client server relationship and you can go to the window activity window. So it's you just go up to the window menu and choose activity. And in the activity window, you will see any of those server operations happening. And you might see one that says it's moving, you know, 1100 messages or something. And uh, and it'll, it'll well, it won't let you know when it's done, but it will disappear from the activity window when it's finished. So that's the uh, that's the way I would do this. Thoughts on that, John? I'm with you that message level is is preferred because I've had problems in the past <clears throat> trying to do it at a higher level. It doesn't always get it right. It doesn't get it right. That's right. Yeah. Message level is better. And, and I, you know, remember, because your Mac stores a local copy of this stuff, I, I always recommend shoot a backup of, uh, of your Mac or at least your, your mail folder, home library mail before you start mucking about with all of this stuff that matters greatly to you. But you know, that's just me. Makes sense. Good. Sometimes, sometimes, yeah. uh, you know, Graham shared a very interesting thing. Uh, it's sort of related to this moving mail thing. Not exactly office 365. He says, 
Uh, back in episode 665, a listener was asking about getting mails from an old IMAP hosting account over to a new one. If it wasn't mentioned in that episode, or it wasn't mentioned in that episode, but I'm not sure if it has been highlighted since that Google offers a data migration service for just this situation. And he's totally right. He's got a link for us that we'll put in the show notes by supplying Google, a.k.a. G Suite, with all the relevant credentials for the old server and accounts. You can ask it to just pull a copy of the information across server to server for large accounts and domains with multiple accounts. This is a very efficient way to have the import run in the background, possibly for several days. The G Suite administration console allows you to check back on the progress of each account import and will provide a log file of any messages that couldn't be imported. The one gotcha I encountered out of several domain migrations I've done is that the old mail server must be able to provide a secure IMAP connection with a certificate that actually matches the connection credentials. If the old hosting is on a shared hosting server, this may mean to having this may mean having to enter the real server name as shown on its certificate rather than the domain name of one of the mail accounts. But he says, I've used it several times and it has worked splendidly. So thank you so much for that, Graham. That's pretty darn cool. I like it. That's pretty good, right, John? That's Google doing things to, uh, you know, to help us. Yeah, clean up the mess they made. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know about that, but I don't know that this cleans up the mess they made, but it certainly makes life easy. So, yeah, good. Moving on to Steve. Steve's got a tip. Steve writes somewhere here. He says, uh, your listener that wanted to connect a 5K display on his Mac should look at this new device from Sonnet. And it is the Sonnet Thunderbolt 3 dual dis display port adapter. And again, as the, or not again, but as the name implies, this is only for Thunderbolt 3 Macs, but... What you get is um, you can connect either two 4K displays from a single Thunderbolt 3 port on a Mac or by using the dual both of the display port ports together. That's how you can connect to a 5K display from your single Thunderbolt 3 uh, port on your Mac or on a Windows machine. That's pretty cool. And I think it's it's relatively ch cheap. Or I should say inexpensive because, um, yeah, it's 79 bucks. So, and it's, you know, it's a pretty straightforward little thing. So thank you so much, Steve. That's great. I like that answers that question. Makes me think maybe I could get another 5K monitor, but I'd need to get a Thunderbolt 3 iMac first. And I don't have one of those yet. Maybe you'll, you'll get me one for my birthday, John. Maybe. Oh, <laughs> the surprise awaits. My, I'm waiting with bated breath. Yeah, good. You want to tell us about your, uh, you had, you had some hard, actually we've both had some hard drive issues. Um, it, you know, I, I will, I will tell you about mine briefly because it's very brief. I mentioned in the last show, John, that, uh, I was having a problem where this machine was slow when I was running, um, my iTunes. Well, it turns out the internal drive in this Mac has gone bad. So this is a pre fusion drive 2011 iMac that has a one terabyte SATA drive. And a, I think it's a 256 gig SSD, but it's, it's not a fusion drive. It was not built to be, it was kind of, you know, came out a little bit before the fusion drive concept was rolled out. And uh, I tested it with drive genius. I tested it with drive genius four, then I upgraded and I tested it with drive genius five and they both say the same thing, that that drive's dead. Or it has lots and lots of bad spots on it. So now I'm not sure if I'm going to take this machine apart. I've moved all that data to an external drive. But if I were to take this apart, I would not replace the internal spindle drive. Because why would I want to put another drive in there that someday I'm going to have to replace? Um, it's an iMac, so it's not like it moves around all the time. So I'm not sure if I'm ever going to take that bad drive out. But uh, that's why things were slow. I mean, you had a you, any thoughts on that before you before you tell us what you went through with the bad drive? Because what you went through might be related to you know might help me might add some color to this. Ah, uh, could I'll tell you what I ran into. Okay, 
but I solved it. So um, sometimes your computer lies to you or the software lies to you or it's just misinterpreting what's happening. But um, so I do a Karma Copy Cloner backup on my Mac Mini. Sure. Um, and I schedule it to run, yeah, every, every morning. And I also run Drive Genius, including their component called Drive Pulse. And uh, it runs in the background certain tests, uh, an integrity check, and also a physical check. You know, it'll scan the drive and make sure that, you know, it can read things. And all of a sudden, it started, uh, over the last couple of months, it really started getting cranky. <laughs> and that it was saying, uh, you know, there's a physical error on your drive. Um, it's a it's a two and a half inch, you know, a, a, one of the smaller drives, because I have a whole pile of those. And, uh, but, you know, it said, um, and it's inside a OWC enclosure, a USB 3 enclosure, uh, one of their inexpensive um ones that I, I got a while ago and it kept saying there was a problem with the drive and I was like okay well you know I guess that drive's dead put in another drive I you know I have four or five of these uh drives uh, from various computers and other devices and uh, and it kept reporting saying physical error physical error physical error mm. and I'm like you know what it, it seems highly unlikely that every drive that I put in here has a physical error <laughs> So after like the third drive that I put in there kept reporting that, I'm like, hmm, you know what? Why don't we replace part of the problem here? And part of the problem, as it turns out, was the enclosure. Because I put the drive in a USB 2 enclosure that I had, and the errors went away. No more errors. Oh, all right. So I, I don't know, uh, and the, the warranty on this particular model of case. I mean, it's inexpensive. Um, sure. But it was a year, so it was out of warranty. And I don't know if I blew it up or a component failed or something. It could be the cable. It could be the enclosure. It's one of the two. Yeah, things happen. Right. Right. Had a problem. So, uh, huh. So what I did do also, but I wanted to, but the thing is, I, you know, uh, uh, wanted to get another USB 3 enclosure. And, uh, and I did find a dandy one, Dave, on Amazon. So I had some uh, Amazon bucks. So I'm like, you know, let me look on Amazon. Sure. Although I love OWC as well. And I looked on Amazon and I found, and it looked pretty slick and it got like a high rating, like number one bestseller or something like that. It's a Sobrent two and a half inch SATA to USB 3 tool free external hard drive enclosure for the amazing low price of $9.99. Sounds about right. Yeah, yeah. And it also has a, a different, um, uh, the, the cable is different. So, so the OWC one had Wait, a- Wait, it comes a, with a cable for nine ninety nine. Yeah. Wow. Okay, the that's cable, pretty good But price. here's the weird thing, but the cable, so the, the OWC cable was uh, a USB-A, I think, um, yeah. you know, square. And the other end of it was some wacky flat thing that- uh, Really, I've only seen on the on the OWC case. This one has a USB A to USB A with the additional lines to support USB three, and um, you know, popped in. It's also tool free. Basically, you just slide the top off, slip your drive in there, and then you know, it's got little tabs and stuff like that. Whereas the the other one actually, you know, had two screws. So, so I think I know what you're talking about, John. I'm gonna I'm gonna send you a link here by way of our. Um, chat room because I want you to look at this, but I think the cable you're describing is um, an, an a USB a to USB micro B cable, which is sort of that flat thing that is regularly used for USB three external hard drive enclosures. Um, and I, I think that's what you're talking about with the, the OWC enclosure that you that you mentioned. Is that right? Yes. Okay. So yeah, that's micro B that's, that's pretty standard and it's nice because it, it, it is much, much thinner than a USB a cable. So enclosure manufacturers can sort of build things to be a little more compact and efficient. If you're, if you're using a USB B micro B because it's, it's not only flatter, but it's also much shallower a port. So there you go. That's, that's why that exists. So, Here's, here's, um, but, but what strikes ahead. me yeah. is that, and, and you know, they even say this, if you run the extended physical test in drive genius, 
So the drive pulse doesn't really, but if you run it from the program itself, they'll actually say, well, you know, what we're really saying is that if we say there's an error, it could be the drive, but it also could be the cable right. or the connection. Right. I spend, and I suppose that's true with what I've got I, going on here too. Yeah. I mean, it seems kind of weird to me because I would think that, you know, if, if they say there's a physical error that it's the drive reporting, Hey, you know, this sector is bad, but I guess right. a bad connection can make this happen as well, which in this case, you know, whether it was the, the circuit board or the cable or something, I guess a bad connection can to certain software look like a physical error. Sure. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Of course. Yeah. All right. So, you know, the, you brought up something interesting because I mentioned that I confirmed that that my drive was bad with uh, Drive Genius. And of course, Drive Pulse that you mentioned told you about your bad drive is part of Drive Genius. And Drive, Bul drive Pulse, in theory, would have and, and should have told me about this drive that was failing so I didn't have to suss it all out on my own. But it didn't. And the reason it didn't is because I had turned it off. Uh, and I had turned it off because one of the things that Drive Pulse does is it tells me if I'm running low on free space. The problem with that is it has a calculation that if you are using more than 90% of your drive or said another way, if you have more less than 10% of your disk's entire capacity free, then it's going to alert you every hour on the hour, maybe not on the hour, but it's just about every hour that those alerts come up. And for rotational drives, I couldn't agree more. I've always maintained that that 10% number on a rotational drive is great uh, because you need that sort of buffer to keep from getting fragmentation happening and all of those things. But on an SSD, man, I, I don't think that same metric applies. I think it's a not a percentage. It's a hard limit. And for me, I like to make sure I have, you know, five gigs or more free on an SSD of any size. It doesn't matter how big it is. And really, the only reason I say five gigs is just to have some buffer room in case you start downloading some big file or something. You want to make sure you have enough room to fit that. Now, obviously, having more than five gigs free is good, but there's no um, there's no other reason with an SSD that I can think of to have that. So, you know, I, I, like I said, I've got a 256 gig SSD in this machine. It usually has um, about 40 gigs free, but if I haven't moved everything and all the podcast archives over now, I run Hazel because Allison Sheridan told me to, and Hazel t deals with archiving off things more than two weeks old over to my, my disk station. But before I did that, I would constantly run somewhere between you know, 10 and 20 gigs free. And it was totally fine. But drive pulse would yell at me all the time. And I, so I just had to turn it off. And because of that, I didn't get these warnings about the physical errors. So I, I've asked the ProSoft folks if they would, you know, maybe deal with SSDs differently, but I haven't heard back. So there you go. Do you have any thoughts on that? Am I crazy for thinking that I, I, it's okay to run with less than 10% of an SSD free? Uh, I've never gotten to that point. Okay. Well, there you go. Yeah, yeah. I get two SSDs and they're both terabytes. And Okay. Yeah. 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 Well, I think any drive you want to. Yeah. But to have, but okay. So even with a terabyte SSD, would you want it to start warning you if you have less than a hundred gigs free? That seems crazy to me. Hmm. No. Right? I mean, you could get down to 30 gigs free and still be totally fine. Right? I mean, is am I sure. missing something? Yeah, okay. That's my thoughts on that. Uh, you want to take us to the first David, John? Yeah, this is an interesting one. Okay. It also involves some lies, as far as I know. <laughs> um. Let me see. So here's what he says. So I just updated to a Deco system and changed oh. my Wi-Fi network, forgetting that I needed to change the Wi-Fi on my second generation Apple TV, and that I lost my original remote. Now I can access the Apple TV from my iPhone remote app. I tried this approach, 
But when I plugged the Apple TV into my MacBook Pro, all it did was blink, and I did not see the Apple TV in iTunes. Any thoughts? Then we got an update. I decided I was being too clever, so I purchased the new Apple TV remote, but I still cannot navigate the Apple TV menu. The unit boots up, and it looks like a normal interface. When I use the remote, the indicator blinks as if it's recognizing the remote, but nothing happens. Well, here's what's happening. Or here's what you got to do. Well, you got to go to the Apple TV menu that pairs the remote. Oh, wait, you can't because it's not paired. <laughs> oh, chicken, this is, meat, egg. Exactly. So this is the problem here. So since you're seeing the light flash on the remote uh, on the Apple TV, it, it knows that there's some somebody out there. Right. Um, but it's not paired. So the thing is, there is a... Uh, uh, there's a little ditty that Apple publishes here, and the title of the article is Link or Unlink Your Apple Remote Aluminum or White from Your Apple TV. Now, here's where they lie, though. At least that's, uh, that's what David told me. So they say what you got to do is, hold it, is you want to hold down the menu and the right button for five seconds. And that's what the article says. Uh, he followed up with me and said, well, uh, I actually had to hold down the menu and the left button. And that huh. paired it. So once that happened, um, I guess he's, a, he's in good shape. They can now control his Apple TV again. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. Uh, people in the chat room have another suggestion, John. And that mm -hmm. is, if you've got an iPhone, use the remote app on your iPhone. Uh, or as PJ says, so as Brian Monroe suggested the iPhone app first and as did PJ and then PJ said, or even your Apple watch, because you can navigate all of the things you need to on your Apple TV with your, the remote app on your iPhone. And that pairs, that pairs in a different way. So um, it, it, uh, it shows you a number on the screen and then you type it in and you're good to go. Mm -hmm. So yeah, there you go. Yes, yes. Good, good stuff. All right. You want to take us to uh, the second David? I don't even know. I don't think these are the same. We have lots of Davids in the show and not just yeah. not just the one that uh, says greetings at the beginning. But yeah. So David asks a good question here. Gentlemen, I started listening to previous, po previous podcasts and found one on routers. I recently upgraded to the Synology 2600 AC and it's working okay but the wireless in my house in certain spots on the second floor are a bit spotty I'm looking into Eero but one thing I don't get would I have to replace my 2600 AC I use it as my out, outer boundary to the internet via my cable modem so he uses it I, as his router right? Yes. yeah okay or yeah. could I just turn off the 2600 AC wireless and use the Eero just for the wireless and not for the other features that being the case, is zero overkill, since I would be using only the wireless mesh and Ethernet backhaul. And might a different solution be better? Or does the mesh? Oh. And might a different solution be better? Um, look forward to your input. I'll give you some input. Okay. The thing is, I, in my humble opinion, and you have an opinion on this too, Dave. I do. I don't. I don't see your follow up here. But um, one thing that I would try, I. Uh, I think Eero may be overkill for this. Well, I I don't disagree with that actually. Uh, I mean, it you there can are, certainly do it, and I, I we have listeners doing it, and it's blissful, right? Because you get the routing capabilities and and like Cloud Station and all of the great stuff that you already have in the RT twenty six hundred AC, and then you get the meshing capabilities of of Eero, and that's pretty awesome. But it is not an inexpensive solution. And you're like, like, uh, like David says, you're literally disabling the fairly awesome uh, Wi-Fi radios. They're both four by four radios inside that RT 2600 AC. So that's, that's kind of sad, but you know, if money's no object, sure. If money's an object as it is for most of us, John, you have a solution. And so one, I, I actually did, what he proposes is certainly possible. Totally. I actually did this with my Archer in that at one point when I wasn't quite sure how to get it to sign IP addresses the way I wanted it to. Right. I actually took my Archer C9, turned off the Wi-Fi, 
um, still use it as my router and then put the Eero in bridge mode. And that's certainly doable. Totally doable. Yeah. But I'm going to propose, because I've tried this as well. I, I'm going to propose, because it sounds like you only have one spot that's spotty. Yep. Spot, spot, spot. <laughs> um, TP-Link has a dandy line of network rage extenders. And when you look at the features on some of these, so I tried one of their lower end ones, the uh, AC1200 Wi-Fi range yeah. extender, RE350K. And it does as advertised, it'll extend the range. Um, though I did look and they actually have some higher end units, Dave, where they're using all the right words, very Eero-like. So it does MIMO and beam forming and, and all this wonderful stuff. And is less expensive right. than an Eero. I, I think they're they're in the order of you know a hundred something dollars or less. Yep. So um, you know maybe try one of those. Uh, you know maybe get it from a place that lets you return it if it doesn't work out for you. But I I I would entertain that as a possible way to help that dead spot there. So here's here's the thing, and I, and to be fair, it's been a little while, maybe six or eight months since I've tried the. TP-Link range extenders. In fact, it's been a while since I've tried any range extenders because I've really been focused a lot on this mesh thing uh, lately, as you might have noticed. Uh, but my big issue with there's two issues I have with with range extenders. Number one is that you have to manage them from a separate interface, right? It's not like true mesh where you get one interface to manage all of the access points and they all talk with each other. Okay. Um, that in, and in this scenario, short of doing what we said, turning off the radios and, and you know, buying an Eero or some other mesh system, uh, you're not going to get that. So, OK, fine. The other problem in this is, uh, you know, managing it is is not really a big deal because you're not going to be in there every day managing it. I mean, for the first couple of days, you might. But then it just, you know, it does its job where the second issue with range extenders comes in for me is network names by default. Range extenders tend to have their own SSID. Uh, so you would have, you know, John's network or David's network. And then you would, ha as your, say, Synology router name. And then you would have David's network extension given to you by the range extender. And so now yep. you've got to. I remember that with the TP link. I actually had to, by default, yeah. they give it a unique name, which to me is. Bad practice, as I think you're saying. Yeah, well, yeah, but it, I mean, I, I grok why they do it, because otherwise then you don't know what you're connecting to and it's hard to troubleshoot and all of that stuff. Uh, but it it's more of a headache to have to manage moving from, you know, one network to the other, especially the way that iOS and Macs handle it, where they will hold on to even a weak network signal if it's the top one in your list most of the time. There's some scenarios where that won't happen. But um, so because of that, I don't like naming it the same name. And as you indicated, you can go into the TP-Link settings and give it the same name. And, and then that makes life a lot better. However, for 108 bucks at Amazon, you can start to build uh, what I call a not quite quasi mesh. And that's with the ubiquity amplify HD mesh points. So they are 108 bucks a piece on Amazon. And what they do is these are the same mesh points that will plug in to, or that, that come with the ubiquity amplify HD full on mesh system. It's exactly the same uh, mesh points. And these are kind of like I described the Eero Beacon earlier. They plug, they, in fact, they, they were the first ones on the market with this for mesh. They just plug directly into the wall. They don't have Ethernet ports on them or anything, but they do have three by three radios in them, which is sort of unique in the mesh world. Uh, and it's two radios, a five gigahertz and a, uh, a 2.4. What the really cool part is they do their best to meshify your existing setup. So they inherit the wireless SSID, they extend your network in that way. Um, obviously, they can't do true mesh with your router because your router doesn't really know about them. But if you then add a second one, 
they will start doing mesh amongst each other, including multi hop stuff. So if it needs to do it that way, like it starts to get really intelligent because it's already got all those those smarts in it from being part of the the ubiquity amplify product line. So if you are in like for exact for what you describe here, David, I think the Amplify HD mesh point is far and away the best option for you because it lets you continue to use the stellar radios that you have in your Synology router. Obviously, it lets you continue using the routing of your Synology router, and then you start to meshify things and and get this uh, extension in a smarter way than than range extenders let you do it. So that's my, uh, you know, that's my thoughts on this. It's fun stuff. Right? Good? I think we covered all the bases. I think we did. Most of them. Most of them. Uh, you know, while we're here, uh, let's have uh, let's have JP answer, ask his question so that we can, we can answer JP, it for him. Uh, calling with a Eero question. I would love nothing more than to start dumping the Apple airports now that they are no longer supported. And in fact, uh, I found that uh, my extreme base station was fouling up my network at my house in Maine. And uh, once I took it out of the uh, system, everything is working flawlessly. Uh, and I was blaming my ISP, but in fact, it was the culprit was the airport extreme which just stuns me because it was brand new. Anyway, um, I have Cat6 in my house. Uh, I wire it to every room, and then I plug in a, uh, formerly an Airport Express, uh, and extend the network uh, hardwire-wise. Can I do that with the Eero nodes? I know not the uh, repeaters, but the, uh, you know, the originals, the disc-sized with I believe they have Ethernet ports. Can I can I set it up the same way as I did before, or do Eros only work uh, wirelessly to each other? And then secondly, what do I do about uh, the lack of USB printing on the uh, Eero? Let me know. Thanks. Yeah, of course. You cut bet. Me off. You are cut off. Um, yeah. So what you are asking, the answer is yes, you can do this with the Eero. Uh, what you are asking is, does the Eero support Ethernet backhaul? Backhaul being the communication between all of the mesh points uh, amongst themselves. And uh, and of course, you know, what, when we talk about mesh the first thing we're talking about is wireless backhaul, meaning it's happening over the air, just like we discussed with the the Amplify HD points. That's doing the backhaul wirelessly and intelligently uh, over multiple bands if, if necessary. Uh, and then Eero would, of course, do the same thing wirelessly. That's how that's that's basically what we're being sold with mesh stuff. But Ethernet backhaul is going to be way more efficient in ninety nine percent of the scenarios if you have it in your walls and you do so Eero uh, will support that. I will say this, not all of the mesh products out there support it. Orbi is the, the Netgear Orbi is the first one that comes to mind that does not support ethernet backhaul. And this is actually why I wrote a couple of weeks ago, I wrote an article called how to choose your mesh network. And, and I talk through each of these things so that for those of you that, have ethernet in your walls you want to consider that before you you buy a mesh so that you're getting the right one uh to maximize what you have so i'll put a link to that in the show notes but the the short answer is yeah you're all do it here's the bad answer eros ethernet supports do not let you connect a printer or anything those are ports for diagnostic purposes only and really non-functional for you um the good news is though you have an airport that you could do this with. If you turn off its wireless radios and put it into bridge mode, it could still be a print server for you pretty much anywhere you want. So that maybe that's the, uh, maybe that's the answer. Uh, thoughts, John. Hmm. No. Yes. Uh, it, it, Brian Monroe is, uh, is correcting me. He's saying USB ports. You mean not ethernet ports and it's possible. I misspoke. So, 
The Ethernet ports on the Eros are fully functional and can be used for wireless backhaul. The USB port on the Eero is not functional for you. Uh, you can't plug a drive or a printer into it. So if I screwed that up, uh, my apologies. And also thank you to Brian Monroe for catching it so that I didn't leave you all hanging for a week. <laughs> yeah. All right. We've got time. Eh, you know what? Let's stick with the um, the networking stuff here. We'll, we'll jump to listener Mike who asks, uh, I'm having problems with my video data phone service. I'm hoping you can suggest a solution for years. My house was wired. Uh, the cable came into the house in the basement. It was split there. One path went right up to TV one. The second path went to the opposite end of the house, to the attic, uh, off a second splitter. And then another path went to TV two. Um, and, uh, he says there was a phone jack and two printers, wired off of this second path lately he says my data and phone service is dropping out the tv signal was never impacted i could usually recover data and phone by waiting several minutes or at worst resetting the modem with a paperclip sometimes this would happen as often as five times an hour uh, the current explanation from my provider is that the signal to the modem is too weak and out of spec they suggested moving the cable modem to a shorter run as a temporary test, I moved the cable modem down off of less splitters, uh, and it seems to work. We haven't lost data or phone yet. The shorter cable run to the modem might be the solution. However, not having the phone base station, because now that is not the because the phone base station comes off the modem, uh, not having that where we liked it is a major inconvenience, not to mention that now my Printers and such on the second floor are offline. So, uh, yeah, it, 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 certainly a weak signal will affect your cable modem differently than it will affect your TVs. I've seen that, too, because it, it really needs your cable modem needs a signal in both directions to be very rock solid. And your TV, while it will use a bidirectional signal or some of them will, uh, it's not the, the, the needs are different. It's a different setup. So um, getting a new modem might have solved this because it's possible modems, you know, they heat up and I have seen them sort of get weaker over time, uh, especially with that ability to send data back over less than ideal cables. Um, here's the thing. Now that you've got the modem downstairs and you don't have ethernet anymore up in the office where it used to be on the longer run. Um, I think Mocha is going to be your friend. You have existing coax going to the office and, uh, and Mocha will let you effectively send an ethernet signal over your coax. It can live right alongside your TV signals and your cable data modem signals. It, it's totally separate. It uses a different channel range, so it just doesn't get in the way. And it's a uh, it's a beautiful thing. So I think that might solve it. And then that lets you kind of put your cable modem uh, where you might want it and hopefully get your phone service back and working, too. Thoughts about that, John? I thought you were going to send me some Mocha stuff. <laughs> I don't have I haven't tried Mocha it yet because I send you. Yeah, oh, yeah. I, thought, I thought you did. Huh, all right. I, I can put you in. I'll put you in touch with the, the Mocha folks. Yeah, that'd be good. Yeah, because I do have. um yeah, I have F connectors on uh, yeah, in, in this room and downstairs and all that. So right. Uh, oh yeah, so you could effectively do wireless wired Ethernet backhaul with your network over Mocha, which is what I'm doing actually in the house. Yeah. Yeah. So I have to. Uh, yeah, I'll have to because I also got a bunch of splitters around, so that may uh, that may ruin everything. Um. No. I like Mocha runs really well with with. Very no. badly wired homes, and mine is a great example and testament to that. <laughs> so, yeah, yeah, I mean, it, it you might, but it might be worth getting, you know, some better splitters. It's also definitely worth, and I'll put, I'll put a um a link to my favorite Mocha. Uh, there's really only one vendor to use, and that's Action Tech. So I'll put a link to that in the show notes, but um, but I'll also put a link uh 
to a point of entry filter. So these Mocha adapters, I should look them up very quickly just to get a current price. These Mocha adapters, it's 150 bucks for the pair. This is bonded Mocha 2, so it's going to run many channels. And like I said, I've got crappy wiring in my house. I get about 800 megabits a second. Um, with, uh, But I was getting like 700, maybe even just shy of that until I plugged in a point of entry filter, which is like six bucks. And you put it literally at the point where coax enters your house and f- and it, it filters some of that stuff out and makes your in-house lines way cleaner and that frees up mocha and, and everything's happy. So there you go. That's uh, that's how it goes. You know, whatever. Uh, but. You know, the uh, the time has come, my friend, to talk of many things. But I'm not going to sing Alice in Wonderland to you. Right? I'm going to sing something to you. What you- nah, no, I'm not going to sing it. I'm just going to spell it out, Dave. Feedback at MacGeekab.com. Did you say feedback at MacGeekab.com? You heard me right, my friend. If you want to write to us, you want to send an email to feedback at MacGeekGab.com. Sweet. Uh, you can also find us on Twitter. Visit Twitter.com slash MacGeekGab for the show. Visit Twitter.com slash John F. Braun for him. Twitter.com slash Dave Hamilton for me. Twitter.com slash MacObserver for MacObserver. And of course, Twitter.com slash Pilot Pete for Pilot Pete. I do want to thank this week's premium Mac Geek Gab supporters. Those of you uh, that support us with premium can email us at premium at MacGeekGab.com. Then this week's biannual, every six month renewals were Louis Michel, Joshua O, Margaret M, Paolo B, Laurent L, Daniel P, Tyler V. Thank you so much to all of you. And then uh, our monthly $10 renewals that came in this week were James B, David G, John G, James C, Paul M, Joe S, Sebastian K, Mark R, and JC. Thank you to all of you. It really means a lot to us to have your direct support. And it really helps out. So thank you, thank you, thank you. I want to thank Cashfly, John. C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y dot com. For providing all the bandwidth to get the show from us to you. Anybody you want to thank, John? I'm always doing all the thanking here. But, you know, you're here too. Not at the moment. Not at the moment? All right. Say thanks to all our listeners. Thank you for listening. There it is. It's that simple. Yeah. It really, And it does. Like, being a listener makes a huge difference for us. Not only do you, uh, do you just, you know, get the, the value that we were able to share with this show... But you can contribute to that value by sharing tips or and really asking questions is is a huge contribution to the show. So it all really, really helps out. Uh, of course, I want to thank our sponsors in this episode, Eero, E-E-R-O dot com, where coupon code MGG saves you uh, on free overnight shipping. Barebones software at barebones.com, the makers of BB Edit. Smile at smilesoftware.com slash geek. And other world computing at maxsales.com. John, it'll be a week before we do this again. Have a good week. Have a splendid time with whatever it is you're doing. And I mean this for all of you out there too. But please follow these three easy words. Don't get caught. Made up. See you next time.